Welcome everyone to the uh, Cousin Center Psychoneurology uh, seminar series uh, this spring of 2021 with great hope in the air and positive feelings abounding. So with that sort of notion, we're having an opportunity to welcome Heather Brenhaus to the, as a virtual visitor, she was going to come last year, but uh, wasn't able to because of the COVID and now she's able to visit with us today in a virtual format. Her topic of her conversation with us today is neuroimmune impacts of early life adversity on development and psychopathology. But before she begins her uh, talk, what I'd like to do is just give you sort of a brief overview. I've had a really great opportunity to chat with uh, Heather before we began. Heather um, is, um, is currently at uh, Northeastern University in the Department of Psychology. Uh, she uh, trained uh, at Binghamton University in New, in New York and then went on to Rutgers and then to Northeastern, uh, where she obtained her PhD and then uh, did a fellowship at Harvard uh, McLean at Harvard Medical School, McLean Hospital. Uh, she's currently uh, associate professor of psychology, having advanced from assistant to associate in six years. And um, she's really had a really remarkable publication um, record. I think one of the things that, that one of the articles that brought my attention was, and I recommend people to look at, is a publication that was in Biological Psychiatry in 2011, looking at non steroidal anti inflammatory treatment in the preventing the delayed effects of early life stress in rats. And so that groundbreaking work was followed up by a number of other studies that looked at the underlying mechanisms and the relationships to cortical NMDA, which was published in, um, in Brain Be Behavior and Immunity. Um, also, she's done really groundbreaking work looking at functional uncoupling of these receptors in the prefrontal cortex and, and was selected and in relationship to early life stress and was selected by Neuropsychopharmacology as a editor's choice publication in uh, 20, 2015. And then she has this really nice paper that just came out in eLife. And uh, this is a really very prestigious electronic journal that's widely disseminated, looking at altered cortical limbic connectivity and sex specific adolescent outcomes in the rat model of early life adversity. In addition to all that, she's always also been looking at substance abuse and uh, issues and, and how some of these mechanisms uh, play out in, in those fields. And so I encourage people in the, in the psychology group, as well as Semmel Neuropsychi Neuropsychiatry to reach out to her if there are co potential collaborations. Uh, she's very well funded and, um, and congratulations for getting a, a, a extension of the ongoing work that she's been doing, looking at the mechanisms of threat sensitivity and early life adversity. So it's really a remarkable um, trajectory of, of the last few years. And I welcome uh, Heather to talk with us today about her work on neuroimmune mechanisms. Thank you, Heather. Thank you so much, Dr. Irwin, for uh, that beautiful introduction. Um, and I'm gonna just share my slides here with everybody. Um, so first of all, um, I'm really grateful to be here um, or virtually here with you. I definitely would have rather the original plan, which was going to be um, actually not only coming out to see you all in person, but also actually having my entire family um, come and fly out. And we had a, a whole plan. We were going to rent a motorhome and travel around all the national parks around that area. Um, and it would have been fantastic. But um, I am sufficiently grateful to be here to talk to you, especially a group uh, with such expertise in psychoneuroimmunology, because I don't really get a chance to talk about this part of my work with, uh, with too many people. So this is going to be really exciting, and I'm really, uh, I'm really excited to hear your, your thoughts, your, your ideas, your, your questions. So what I will be talking to you about today is, is, a, is a general interest in my lab uh, in how early life experience can drive brain development. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure as many of you are concerned, brain development goes hand in hand with neuroimmune development. Um, and so before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge the people who actually did a lion's share of the work I'm gonna be showing you, my lab at Northeastern. I also have some collaborators at um, McLean where I did my postdoc um, that also helped me with that early work, um, but I just didn't wanna go any further without, uh, without acknowledging them. So, so like I said, uh, my lab is pre preliminarily uh, interested in how exposure to early life adversity can affect 
brain development. Okay, so, um, so when I say adversity, when I say early exposure to early life adversity, what I really am referring to is um, usually a, um, uh, a disruption in the relationship with a caretaker, because that is really the kind of adversity that we see as being um, repeatedly associated with these disorders, right? And that's really the adversity that seems to be, to affect brain development the most. When there is some kind of disruption of a caretaker relationship, we're talking about things like physical abuse, um, emotional abuse, um, or um, emotional neglect. Okay, and the reason I have this image of uh, this sort of ticking time bomb in the frontal part of the brain here is because that really appears to be what it's um, what seems to be happening because these disorders do not seem to manifest during um, uh, during adversity exposure early in development and they not even early in childhood, but not until years later, sometimes after the adversity has ended, uh, not until adolescence and also um, all of these disorders. It, are associated with behaviors that recruit um, function and uh, of the prefrontal cortex and are associated with dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Um, and what we uh, what we seem to um, what se this seems to be attributed to is the fact that the prefrontal cortex is a very late developing region. Um, for, for developmentalists among you, I'm sure this is a slide you've seen many, many times. This is a really great study. Um, from back in 2004 showing this uh, it's structural MRI. So this is actually showing just the um, level of pruning or maturation throughout the cortex. And the more blue regions are the more pruned, the more mature regions in the brain. And the first thing we can see is that the brain doesn't de develop um, across the brain at the same rate. Right? So what we can see here, right, is that the, the brain does not develop um, at the same time, right? Different parts of the brain develop at different, at different time points. And the prefrontal cortex, as you can see, that's the area that's circled here, is the latest developing structure in the brain. It develops very late in, um, in life, and it really isn't fully mature until late adolescence. And so we're starting to think, we're starting to hypothesize as a field that maybe whatever is going on early in development, right, is setting up this kind of development such that it's not until the prefrontal cortex is expected to be online and connected to the rest of the brain, it's not until the prefrontal cortex is starting to be recruited and necessary for those sort of mature decision-making functions that maybe these disorders start to manifest, right? So we, we need, what we need to do, and what I try to do in my lab, is to think about what are the typical, what are the typical trajectories by which the prefrontal cortex and its connections mature? And then what happens early on in life that might be that might be derailing this development such that when it's when it's supposed to be online when when it's recruited it's not where it needs to be right those connections aren't where it needs to be the receptivity and function is not where it needs to be and just the one thing I want to kind of uh, call into attention here is that I, I mentioned stress slash adversity here. And I do that um, on purpose because we talk a lot about early life stress. That's a very kind of common term that we use. And the truth is that a lot of these things that we're seeing, we don't know for sure that it is stress per se that is causing these, these changes, right? So um, obviously these, these traumas and these adversities that we endure early on in development um, are stressful, but we don't know that it's actually HPA activity or it's sort of any kind of neuroendocrine response to stress or the stress per se that's changing these, um, these uh, trajectories of the development. It could be alterations in somatosensory or, um, uh, uh, you know, or, or affective kind of stimuli that are affecting our, our, um, our brain and its development. So I just wanted to kind of call into attention of why I'm gonna be trying to talk about this as early life adversity, because at least in my lab, we haven't been looking specifically at whether this is stress or not. It might be, right? But um, we, we don't know that for sure. So we're interested in this, in this typical development and we're interested in how adversity early in life might derail this development. And so first I'm gonna take you through what we do in my lab. We look at an, a rodent model of early life adversity. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about one paradigm. We use more than, more than one and there's several uh, paradigms that are used in the field. I'll be talking to you about our work with maternal separation 
And what I said before was that early adversity is really most robust um, in terms of its effects on our brain development if you're talking about a disruption between um, an infant and a caretaker relationship. And maternal separation is one of the paradigms that, that does that. Um, what maternal separation is in rodents is we take our pups away from their mother and their litter mates for four hours per day for the entire pre-weanling period. And not only is that obviously um, traumatic for the, um, for the pup to be away from um, the, the mother and uh, its social the social stimulation of its litter, um, also we found that when the mother returns to the litter, um, her maternal behavior is disrupted, okay? So it's not just this four hours of adversity a day, it's also for the, through the, throughout that entire pre-weaning period, there's an altered relationship between the mother and the pups. And if anybody wants to talk more about that, we've got lots of really interesting data about how this communication is altered. Um, that we're continuing to learn about. But this is our paradigm that I'm going to be talking about um, for, I think, the entire, the entire time with you today. And so um, the animals are put through maternal separation from postnatal day two to 20, which like I said, is the entire pre-weaning period. And then we can look at their behavior or their, their blood um, or their brains um, throughout development. And we do this usually in three different, um, around three different ages, usually in juvenility, uh, postnatal day 25, um, around adolescence, which is postnatal day 40 is about you know, middle adolescence. Uh, so you'll be seeing some, some ages surrounding that um, or in adulthood, usually either early adulthood or, or later adulthood. So between postnatal day sort of 70 or 90. So those are the, that's sort of the time course that um, I'll be talking about today. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is some of the behaviors that we've noticed that are consequences of this paternal separation paradigm. Um, we've, we've been looking at a lot of a whole range of both cognitive and affective uh, consequences of maternal separation. I'm going to be talking mostly about cognition here in this talk. Um, and so the first, um, the first cognitive task that we put our animals through uh, was for working memory, looking at working memory and spatial memory in these rats. And so in the way that we do this is we, um, we put them through what's called a wind shift maze, a wind shift task. And for those of you who don't know what this is, I'll just go through it really quickly. Um, it involves two phases. One phase, a rat is placed in the middle of an eight arm radial maze. Four of the arms are baited with food um, and the other four arms are blocked. And so the animal first in this phase just has to go and forage for the, um, for the food. And we can track whether the animal knows, you know, sort of where it's been, where it hasn't. So if it sort of re makes a re-entry into, um, into one arm, that's one kind of an error. Okay, but then the second, ta uh, second phase, we remove um, all of the, the, block the blocked arms, but the only arms now that are baited are the ones that were previously blocked. So now the animal has to remember where it's been before and where it hasn't, right? So that we're introducing some spatial memory into it and additional working memory, because again, now they have to remember where they just were and, and where they need to go. And we can introduce different, um, uh, different delays into these, uh, between these two phases to look at more things like, things more like uh, long-term memory. Uh, we can introduce five minutes, 30 minutes, three hours. And that's what we've, uh, we've looked at all three of those things. And so without showing you the whole battery of, um, of results, what I can show you is that if we're looking at just working memory, um, working memory deficits, right? Not long-term memory, but working memory deficits, we see that both males and females that were exposed to maternal separation um, do have deficits in this task. They commit more errors on this task compared to control animals. Um, this data I'm showing you right now is from um, adolescent rats. This is, uh, I believe it was postnatal day 50 that, these, uh, that this um, assessment was done in these rats. Okay, so that's just one deficit that we see uh, as a consequence of maternal separation in these rats. And again, these rats went through maternal separation from postnatal day two to 20. Nothing was done to them. They were pair housed with, a litter, with, um, with litter mates until postnatal day 50, and now we're seeing these deficits. Okay. Associated with that cognitive deficit, 
we also saw, and this was actually in the same animals, we also saw a reduction in a really important type of neuron in the prefrontal cortex, um, namely the, the parvalbumin positive interneuron. These interneurons, these GABAergic interneurons, are really, really important. Um, they're fast spiking, um, they're high energy, and they are they have really um, precise connections with, um, with uh, uh, both um, uh, with, with pyramidal neurons in the prefrontal cortex that actually then project out to uh, cortical to subcortical regions. And so these parvovian positive interneurons are really important in the excitatory inhibitory balance in the prefrontal cortex. And they've been shown repeatedly to be really important in cognition and cognitive function. And so this I'm actually showing you um, data from males, but we also see similar effects in females that after maternal separation, we don't see a lot of deficits early on in juvenility. We don't see these deficits until adolescence. We actually see a pretty striking reduction of parvalbumin interneurons in the prefrontal cortex in adolescence. Okay, and again, this is, this is even more robust in males. We do see it um, in both sexes. Okay. But I'm here really to talk to you about psychoneuroimmunology per se. And um, we know uh, that early life adversity uh, does not only affect the brain. We know that um, early life trauma is also associated with um, a host of um, pro-inflammatory disorders like cardiovascular disease, like diabetes. We see increases um, in C-reactive protein. Uh, all, this is all in people, right? So we know that our brains are not the only things that are impacted by early life stress, which makes sense because our brains are not the only things that are trying to make sense of our environment and potential threats to our well-being, right? Our immune system um, does that as well in partnership with the brain. And so for us, maybe it's not that surprising that our immune system is also really drastically affected by early life adversity. And so our question is, how does this relate to how the brain, um, how the brain develops? And, and, many, um, and many folks have actually, or at least some folks have already looked at, at this and have shown in humans that there does seem to be this really interesting um, uh, association between early life uh, trauma, early life adversity, and, inf and inflammatory um, uh, dysfunction, and it's and, uh, in association with psychiatric disorder. And so I'm just gonna show you two studies um, that kind of highlight this. In one study, that was published back in 2012, um, we see that people who came to the clinic and their blood was taken and their IL-6 levels were taken, their pro-inflammatory um, cytokine uh, profile was taken, this is showing IL-6, and then six months later, they were assessed for depressive-like symptoms. These are actually people who were um, vulnerable to, uh, to depression because of a family, um, you know, uh, the family members that, that were, already diagnosed with, with depression. And so we see that there is a correlation between their IL sex levels and six months later, their, um, their depressive symptomology. But this correlation was only apparent in people who had experienced two or more childhood adversities. So we're starting to see that there's this potential sort of subpopulation of people who, who might be um, uh, suffering from depression that, that is associated with pro-inflammatory effects maybe of childhood um, adversity, right? So we see this really interesting correlation in just that population. And we see sort of similar things when we look at this other study showing that IL-6 and also TNF-alpha were elevated in people with schizophrenia only who had also experienced childhood adversity. This was not seen in people with schizophrenia without childhood adversity. So again, we're starting to think about whether there might be a subpopulation of people um, who are living with um, psychiatric disorders that is due to this potentially adversity attributable pro-inflammation, okay? So we started getting really interested um, in, in that possibility. So we took our, um, our rats exposed to maternal separation and we started looking at just their peripheral levels of some um, of some cytokines okay so we look I'm going to show you some data from um, uh, again males and females we looked at um, IL-1 beta we looked at IL-4 and as you can see there are some interesting developmental changes we looked from juvenility all the way through um, late adolescence and we see some developmental changes in their peripheral levels of these cytokines but we didn't really see any effects of maternal separation 
um, in these animals, right? There was no really, uh, there didn't seem to be any differences until we looked at um, uh, the the anti-inflammatory cytokine uh, IL-10. And that was where we started seeing that there were lower levels of IL-10, specifically in males. Um, we also see it in the females, but it was much more re robust in males. Lower levels of IL-10 only at postnatal day 35, which again is sort of mid-adolescence, right around when I just showed you that data um, uh, from the wind shift task. So there's this really interesting time period during adolescence, during mid-adolescence, when at least males are showing a reduction of this anti-inflammatory cytokine, which we could maybe, um, uh, you know, uh, at least interpret as a pro-inflammatory profile, right, if there was a decrease in this anti-inflammatory cytokine. So, um, we know that this is going on in the periphery, um, but we're also really interested in what this means for, for the brain and for brain um, development. And so the first thing I can show you is that when we saw this circulating, um, dif these dif differences in circulating IL-10, we started wondering if this was actually even associated or correlated with their behavior. And so luckily we were able to take these animals and the, the, these animals that we had um, longitudinally taking their blood and looked at these levels of cytokines at, after, their last, um, uh, after their last blood draw, we tested them for their, um, uh, their behavior and their, and their um, performance on the wind shift working memory task. And so we're able to correlate their levels from all different stages, right? From juvenility, mid-adolescence, and late adolescence um, on their uh, eventual uh, uh, performance on the wind shift task. And so what we found was that in males, but not females, their levels of IL-10 at P35, that time point when there was lower levels of IL-10 um, in maternally separated animals, those same animals that were exposed to maternal separation had a correlation between their circulating IL-10 at P35 and their working memory at P55, which was when, they're, um, uh, when we did the behavior. Um, this was only true for the maternally separated animals, which is a little bit um, sort of reminiscent of what we just looked at in the people showing that there was a subpopulation of people exposed to, to um, childhood adversity that then went ahead to be sort of have correlations between their, um, their pro-inflammatory profile and their and their, uh, their behavior um, or their affect. And so again, so again, males exposed to maternal separation, the, the higher, uh, I'm sorry, the lower IL-10 that they had in their blood seemed to be correlated with higher levels of errors on the wind shift task. We didn't see that in our females. We saw no correlation of their inflammatory um, uh, profile um, in adolescence with their behavior. Okay, um, but one thing I just wanted to show you, and this is something that we actually, we haven't really followed up on this, and I really definitely want to. What was really interesting is that we did see a correlation in juvenile levels of these cytokines in females with their later behavior. So like I said, they're, in, they're uh, mid-adolescent, right? That post day 35, their mid-adolescent levels of cytokines didn't seem to correlate with their behavior. When we looked at their IL-10 levels and also their IL-4 levels um, in juvenility, that seemed to correlate with their, um, their performance on the wind shift task. Again, I'm not going to be able to tell you much more about this because we haven't really followed up um, specifically on this point of development and what's going on, whether their immune, uh, their, uh, immune profile is, is really saying anything about their brain development, but I thought that was really interesting. So, but I will, what I will be following up on, um, what I will be talking to you about is what we just, what I just showed you in the males, how, okay, so we do have both cognitive um, and uh, neuronal deficits in these males in adolescence, and we also saw this altered pro-inflammatory profile, um, uh, circulating pro-inflammatory profile in these males. In adolescence. So many of you, um, I certainly don't have to explain to you how peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, immune signals can translate into, um, into brain function. Um, so just suffice to say, we know that peripheral um, cytokines can make their way through the blood-brain barrier to the brain. They can actually um, act at the blood-brain barrier, right, to um, incite more pro-inflammatory activity in the brain. Um, and of course, there's also vagal stimulation, right? So there's many ways that 
peripheral pro-inflammatory activity can certainly um, can certainly incite pro-inflammatory activity in the brain. Um, and a lot of this pro-inflammatory activity we know is occurring via microglial activation. And so I wanted to talk about this one um, pathway that we actually were able to um, manipulate um, to look at whether this, this, uh, you know, this immune um, function is actually affecting uh, brain function in these, in these animals. And so just to kind of uh, orient you to what I'll be talking about, we know that pro-inflammatory cytokines, pro-inflammatory activity in the brain can yield uh, increased levels of COX-2, right, so cyclooxygenase 2, this enzyme which catalyzes um, the production of prostaglandins and also can, um, can catalyze the reaction which leads to the uh, kenurinine uh, pathway, which could lead to these um, NMDA acting uh, molecules, quinolinic acid or uh, kenurinic acid, right? And so one, one consequence of this could be uh, hyperactivation of NMDA receptors, um, potentially excitotoxicity, or at the very least altered neuronal plasticity, right? So this, this is something that can happen. And so one question that I asked is, is COX-2 affected in these males, um, in adolescents, when we're talking about exposure to uh, early adversity to maternal separation? And so what I found is that yes, if you look at males exposed to um, uh, maternal separation and you look at them as both juveniles and adolescents, it's not until adolescence we see this, but we do see that levels of COX-2, this is in the prefrontal cortex, um, we actually didn't see this in the hippocampus, by the way, we looked, um, levels of COX-2 in the prefrontal cortex are increased in these males, these adolescent males exposed to maternal separation. Okay, so that's interesting, but is it functionally relevant? Um, what does it really mean? And so then what we went ahead and did is we tried to block COX-2 with a specific COX-2 inhibitor, NS398, um, by giving it just systemically to, this is again, this is all in males. I'll be telling you a little bit about um, some manipulations we've done in females as well. This was in males. We blocked COX-2 um, during early adolescence from postnatal day 30 to 38 again, after maternal separation. And then after that inhibition, we then tested them um, in the wind shift task, in that cognitive task. And we also took their brains to look at their levels of, um, of parvalbumin, right? To see if that was associated um, with the parvalbumin loss. And so again, we, what we did is in this pathway, we actually just tried to block COX-2 with this uh, systemic inhibitor. And we found is that we were able to prevent these increased errors in the wind shift task in these adolescent males. So again, just by blocking COX-2, we were able to block this maternal separation attributable um, uh, cognitive dysfunction in these males. So also I said, we took their brains and we looked for parvalbumin levels, right? The levels of these parvalbumin interneurons in the brain. And when we looked at levels of parvalbumin, we also saw that the COX-2 inhibition could also prevent the loss of PVB of parvalbumin that we saw in the prefrontal cortex of these males. So again, this COX-2 pathway appears to be really important um, in cognitive dysfunction after maternal separation. Um, and so the final part of this that I wanted to show you is that you know the original thing I, I, I just showed you was, was IL-10, right? Circulating IL-10 um, and how that seemed to uh, be associated with, uh, with changes in at least uh, cognition and behavior. And so what we did do is we were able to um, uh, infuse IL-10 into the ventricles um, during adolescence, during that same time period. And we were able to see that just infusing IL-10 into the ventricles could also prevent the loss of parvalbumin um, after maternal separation, again, in, in males. And so, um, you know, the, the question obviously is, you know, would this work in females? It didn't, doesn't, the hypothesis is that it would not because we didn't see these, um, uh, these effects in, in females. Um, but then you start wondering, well, is it, is it a time, is it, is it a time point situation, right? Would this same strategy um, work in females if we were able to um, uh, manipulate these the signaling processes maybe earlier, right? Maybe in juvenility. And so these are things that we definitely still want to try, just haven't had a chance to um, yet. 
right? And that's just showing you that's we were blocking basically that pro-inflammatory activity by um, by giving this IL-10, or at least uh, we were assuming assuming to do that. So, like I said, we're you know we're really you know really excited the fact that we we see this this um, uh, this pro-inflammatory activity in males that we can actually mitigate and and affect behavior. Um, well, what about these females, right? We know that early life adversity um, in humans. Uh, certainly does affect females, right? We saw in the wind shift task, we saw they were affected cognitively for sure. Um, and we know in humans that if anything, actually females are sometimes thought to be um, even more um, robustly affected by, uh, by abuse um, and neglect early in life. Um, and so, you know, what's going on with their, with their immune function and how is that, um, how is that potentially uh, a mechanism? So one thing that we've started really looking at with females is not only effects of early life um, adversity, maternal separation, um, but also the, uh, the addition of second hits of adversity. We know that early adversity is often uh, associated with additional later adversities in life, right? Specifically in, you know, in, in childhood and, and in adolescence. And we also know that multiple traumatic experiences um, during childhood can increase the likelihood and it could also increase the intensity, it can actually have additive effects on these neuropsychiatric disorders. And that really, like I said, appears to be even more robust and more, um, uh, uh, more frequent in, in women. And so we started, this was actually work done by my graduate student, um, Kelsey Gildawi. What we wanted to do is we wanted to look at these, um, this uh, potential for uh, additive effects of, uh, of multiple adversities, right, in childhood. And so what we did was we did a, a range of experiments where, again, we used maternal separation from postnatal day um, to, to 20. Um, we weaned the animals at P21. However, half of those animals were put into social isolation from postnatal day 21 to postnatal day 35. So this is sort of, you know, um, juvenility into early adolescent social isolation, um, which is um, a stressor for these developing animals. And then the other half of animals were just pair housed the way they normally are. And then we grew them up until early adulthood, postnatal day 70, when we could actually collect their brains. And we also looked at their behavior. I'll be telling you about that in a little bit. And so when we took their brains, we saw, like we've seen before, that maternal separation did reduce the levels of parvalbumin in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and so we were, uh, you know, we weren't that surprised about that. We also didn't really see an added effect of social isolation on parvalbumin per se. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the um, that the function of these parvalbumin neurons is the same, um, nor is the, you know, the um, uh, the glutamatergic receptivity the same. So these are all questions that we still want to ask. Um, but the first thing that um, that Kelsey, my graduate student, was really interested in is the fact that parvalbumin neurons, um, these, P, this, these PVB neurons um, in the prefrontal cortex and throughout the brain, are enwrapped, are ensheathed by these extracellular matrices called perineuronal nets. Um, there are extracellular matrices around many different types of neurons. Um, perineural nets are also around many different types of neurons. Um, but these uh, the perineural nets are, are really, pr uh, they're preferentially enwrap parvalbumin positive interneurons, and they are really um, important in the, um, the health and plasticity of these neurons, okay? And they are also, they've also been attributed to critical periods of um, activity and development of these par uh, par uh, parvalbumin positive neurons. We also know that these PNNs, perineural nets, um, are dynamic, right? They're affected by the environment. They're affected by stress. They're affected by learning, right? They, they degrade and, they're, and they grow and they degrade and they grow um, throughout life. Um, and they're, they're, they change based on activity. Um, and so what we were interested in is whether that was something that actually kind of could, um, could start to uh, um, explain maybe some sex differences that we've been seeing um, in, 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 in clinic, right, in, in human populations um, and in some animal studies of, you know, maybe does, does that explain um, how females might be differentially vulnerable? 
And so as you can see from this data, what we did find is that even though parvalbumin seemed to be reduced sort of um, uh, similarly after uh, maternal separation alone or after social, um, uh, social uh, isolation, we see that only in females did both, uh, uh, did, did both maternal separation and social isolation yield reductions in these perineuronal nets that are surrounding parvovumin neurons. So I just wanted, because we, we're starting to look at so many different groups here, I just want to kind of orient you, right? So we're looking at males on the left and females on the right, and we're looking at perineural nets that are surrounding PV neurons. So we did a double stain of parvalbumin and perineural nets, and we're looking at only those cells that were double labeled. And we see that in males, neither um, maternal separation alone, which is designated here under pH or pair housing, um, neither that alone nor um, maternal separation with, um, with social uh, isolation did, did that have an effect on perineural nets. However, if you're looking in the females, while just maternal separation alone didn't seem to have an effect, that's this bar right here, right? Pair, maternally separated, but pair housed, that didn't have an effect, but social isolation after maternal separation did seem to reduce the levels of perineural nets on these parvalbumin neurons, right? So there's obviously a lot more we need to do um, to look at you know, what, this, what this really means, right? And why this even might um, be important. But this was really exciting um, to us that we were actually able to kind of tease apart um, these differences in females, but not males. And so then we're back to our um, you know, neuroimmuno, uh, neuroimmunology, neuroimmunological mechanisms, right? So one hypothesis that was really attractive to us is the idea that if we're thinking about how perineural nets are so dynamic, right? They are degraded and they're formed um, throughout life what kind of a cell type right might be really inherent to that kind of um, you know dynamic um, change in these extracellular matrices and the first cell that we started thinking about were microglia this is actually um, a really beautiful image i think that that kelsey took looking at a perineural net so this is you can imagine the neuron this is a this is a pnn that's surrounding a parvalbumin neuron so you can imagine inside you would if we stain for parvalbumin, you would see a parvalbumin cell inside. This is the extracellular matrix, matrix that's actually surrounding that parvalbumin neuron. And then in purple is a microglia. And what you can just see, you know, just kind of qualitatively is that if you look at the processes, they're really kind of interacting. This is a confocal image. They're really kind of interacting with the perineural net, right? And they're kind of enwrapping some parts of it. And we start really wondering, are the microglia, you know, kind of part and parcel and kind of nibbling away um, at these perineural nets the way, they, they, the way they're known to do. And so we started wondering about microglia and their role in uh, female specific effects of a double hit of, of stress. We know that microglia are important for healthy brain development, right? We know that they support normal neural maturation, right? And we also know from other studies that they do, they are known to interact with extracellular structures um, and they do this in an activity dependent manner, right? So these were all things that kind of led to this possibility that maybe there was a kind of a priming, right? A programming that's going on, which is known to, to happen in, in developing microglia. Maybe this challenge of maternal separation yields this differently programmed microglia later in adolescence, such that an additional stressor of social isolation might be differentially impacting females compared to males. And maybe that's leading to a differential kind of um, interaction of the microglia with these perineural nets. Right, so there's lots of actually, uh, obviously, you know, pieces we need to kind of connect for that kind of hypothesis, but it was really um, attractive also talking, uh, speaking of, of sex differences, right? Because we also know that microglia um, develop differently in males and females. We know that they're seemingly more activated during early life than in females, right? And maybe that means that there is, you know, kind of this opportunity for microglial programming um, early in life that might yield a, a differently vulnerable um, or resilient uh, microglia uh, later in life, right? And so, um, one piece of evidence that we have is that it, when we look at TNF alpha expression in the brain, which we know is largely coming from microglia, so this is TNF and um, mRNA expression in the brain. If we look at males versus females, 
we've actually found that after maternal separation, which are these, um, uh, the stripe bars, right? After maternal separation, we have <clears throat> an increased level of TNF alpha and this is actually the prefrontal cortex of the brain. We also showed this in the nucleus accumbens, right? And so this right here um, is not showing very much, but there actually was um, a difference between even in vehicle without LPS at all. We did see an increase of TNF alpha, just at baseline after maternal separation. I'm not sure if I said this was in adolescence, but even more striking when we gave an immune challenge with LPS to these animals, we saw um, a drastically um, higher increase of TNF alpha um, after maternal separation in males, um, after uh, in males compared in, compared to females, right? So basically, maternal separation caused males to um, uh, be again primed for uh, an immune stimulation with LPS, where we did not see that in in the females at all. So again, this this starts to make us think that maybe maternal separation is programming or priming microglia in males some in in a way that it's not. In females, and maybe that leads to some kind of a difference in um, in the response to a stressor later in life. And so, right. And so, the hypothesis is really, you know, our hypothesis was: is microglial programming in males, but not females, during maternal separation? Is that protecting them, uh, maybe, from this potentially potentiating effect of social isolation on these adult? PNNs, right? We were thinking that maybe um, there, maybe the fact that like they were being programmed in males was somehow protecting them later in life from these effects on perineural nets, right? So that was the hypothesis. Uh, what I'm going to show you is that um, our, 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 our actually data um, was surprising. So the first thing is we were looking at, um, we wanted to look at behavior as well. We wanted to look at not just perineural nets, but also behavior. And the thing about the wind shift task, which, which I showed you already, right? That's one way that we can look at cognition. But the thing about the wind shift task is that it requires um, food deprivation, right? So we, we bait the arms with food and it requires food deprivation in order for them to be motivated enough to actually find the food. The problem with that is that we have found that microglia are actually differentially impacted by food restriction in males and females, especially if you're talking about interaction between um, maternal separation and food restriction. I'm actually not going to take the time to sort of take you through all this data, but basically um, the, the, the point I really wanted to, to sort of impart to you is that there are sex differences in the way microglia respond to food restriction, um, especially at least in adolescence, right? So the fact that that, um, that that could be a confound made us feel that wind, the wind shift task was actually really not the way to go here, right? Because we want to really look at how much glia are just acting um, in response to maternal separation and social isolation. And so what we did was we chose a different cognitive task that I'm going to tell you about today. Also, I think is, is more relevant to um, uh, sort of to the kinds of behaviors that we're really interested in anyway, right? So we wanted to look at social cognition. Uh, and specifically social recognition. I'm gonna just bring you through briefly, bring you through the, the task and what that means. So it's social cognition and social recognition task requires three different phases. Um, the first phase is habituation, where the rat is just exposed to a chamber with two empty cages, right? So this is kind of just looking at its, its uh, response to just pure novelty. Um, and there's no difference between the two, the two sides of the, of the um, arena. The second phase, however, now is looking for just social preference, right? Whether an animal will actually prefer a new animal, which is on one side, a new rat, versus just a novel object, which we usually use as a little sort of plastic shape of a rat. Um, and normally a rat will actually interact more with a novel conspecific, another rat, compared to a novel object. And then the final phase is social recognition, because now we bring back that familiar rat from phase two, and then on the other side of the arena, we, um, we uh, uh, introduce an unfamiliar new novel rat. And typically um, our subjects will actually spend more time with the novel uh, rat. And so just to show you um, representative heat maps, to, um, I could show you that as you can see, they do, um, they do interact more with novelty. So these, re these regions right here are the regions, or hopefully you can see my cursor, regions around the empty cages, right? So they're interested in the cages, but no difference between the two sides. And then, um, and we do counterbalance the sides, by the way. And then you can see that 
when there is a novel rat compared to a novel object, they interact more with the novel rat. And then this is a, oops, this is a typical rat. Um, they spend more time with the unfamiliar rat compared to the um, familiar subject, okay? So if this is typical, then we can actually see whether the animal actually can recognize whether a rat is familiar or not. Um, and so basically we can use a social recognition index to, to see whether the animal has spent, if they spend the same amount of time around with the unfamiliar and the familiar rat, that's telling us they probably don't really know the difference between the two and they're not able to recognize this novel, um, this novel uh, conspecific. And so we did exactly what I showed you before where we put the animals through maternal separation. But in this case, in order to look at whether microglial programming might be protecting males from later effects of social isolation, what we did was we depleted microglia during maternal separation, right? So we wanted to see whether depleting microglia during maternal separation might actually get rid of this difference and actually cause males to maybe now be equally um, uh, um, uh, susceptible to social isolation, uh, you know, equally to, uh, to females, right? That was our hypothesis. So we depleted microglia using liposomal clodronate. Um, for those of you who don't know, right, this is this is what the microglia typically look right look look like right around p um, between p2 and p6. They're actually very amoeboid looking. Um, but if we inject liposomal clodronate, this is um, clodronate. It will induce apoptosis in these microglia. They're in these liposomes, which microglia very much like to gobble up, and they do, and they wind up um, undergoing apoptosis. And so this is what we are left with um, when we look at postnatal day six, we see there's no microglia really left um, in the brain. We actually inject this intracerebroventricularly. And this lasts, this de depletion lasts for about 10 days or so. And so they're depleted for um, a depleted microglia during that early phase of maternal separation. Um, and then we wean them, we put them through the social isolation, like I explained before. Um, and then we looked in adulthood uh, for, at social recognition. We also took their brains to see if our hypothesis actually was supported, right? Was, did depleting microglia um, uh, cause males to actually look more like females? Um, and the truth is that um, no, our hypothesis was actually not supporting, we supported, we were actually quite surprised. This right here is actually very preliminary data. I was actually afraid I was gonna have no data to show you because um, with the pandemic, we were shut down for many, many months and um, we actually just got this data literally last week. Um, so this is preliminary, but um, it wasn't so preliminary that we actually didn't get a real effect. Um, we see that in males, um, there was really no effect of maternal separation um, and social isolation together. Uh, this is, I'm showing you just the double hit, right? So I'm showing you just maternal separation and social isolation together. And we expected, uh, if, I, if our hypothesis was supported, that liposomal clodronate would actually make males worse um, and cause them to actually, um, uh, you know, have an effect of social isolation together with maternal separation on social recognition. This is showing us that that did not occur. So this is again showing a positive social recognition index it means that they did spend more time with the novel rat compared to the um, the uh, the familiar rat. Um, we saw no effect, no matter what the animals got, vehicle um, or or liposomal quadrinate. However. What we did see is that females, the white bars are showing you the vehicle. These are animals that, were ju that just got the liposomes with no clodronate inside. Um, females that got um, vehicle showed a, um, a deficit of their social recognition index, which is, which is what we expected. And liposomal quadrinate, depletion of microglia during, during maternal separation actually seemed to protect them where they no longer had a deficit. Um, and I can tell you that we also did another behavioral task looking at cognition, um, looking at, uh, it's called um, spontaneous alternation, where we're actually looking using a Y maze to test their working memory, basically. Um, and we saw the exact same pattern of effects. Um, I wish I could show you our data in the brain and what this did to their perineural nets or their parvo albumin, and that unfortunately we did not have a chance to do um, by the time I came to talk to you. But this I can just tell you was surprising and also really interesting to me that um, that we did see a sexual uh, a sex difference in the effect of microglial depletion 
it just was not in the direction that we were um, that we were expecting. Um, so I'm looking forward to kind of learning more about this and seeing what this means uh, to uh, perineural nets in these males and females. But so I can really, uh, I can actually conclude now and just kind of give you um, a summary of uh, hopefully what I just uh, what I just told you. First, we did know we did find that early life adversity uh, does lead to dysfunction in the prefrontal cortex uh, mediated behaviors as well as prefrontal cortex parvovulmin um, interneurons. Um, we see that females, especially when we're talking about perineuronal nets surrounding those PV neurons, we see that females require an additional hit of adversity. Um, and I also showed you that early life adversity does yield peripheral um, and central actually immune dysregulation in a sex dependent man uh, sex specific manner with males and females showing very different effects at different times in development. Um, and we see this immune dys dysregulation does predict cognitive deficits, seems to be associated with cognitive deficits. Um, and we see at least in males, adolescent inflammatory activity seems to predict um, cognitive dysfunction. Our working hypothesis is still that uh, microglial activity during development can differentially impact um, vulnerability uh, to later stressors uh, after maternal separation. Uh, but obviously that, that hypothesis is still very much in the works because so far the data is surprising us um, and keeping us on our toes. And so we, you can imagine there's, um, <laughs> these are not the only emerging questions that we have, um, more uh, keep coming up, uh, but these are some. Uh, but more importantly, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your questions and thoughts. Um, and I really want to just thank you all for your, uh, for your attention. And again, for inviting me. This has been fantastic. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Heather, for a very, uh, just a whirlwind of, of research and really great tour of what you've been doing. Uh, we do have some questions and I hopefully we'll have time for all of them. I have a question as well, but first let me go to the, uh, the audience that's generating some questions right now. Um, the first question has to do with estrogen and to what extent estrogen can buffer adolescent females against IL-10. And if that could be, could estrogen treatment reverse or prevent a PV cell or cell count reduction or possibly um, MS or autoimmune um, encephalomyelitis. I mean, sort of the extent of the clinical implications. Yeah, that's a that's a phenomenal question. And we think about that as well. It's um so we did look at estrogen. Um, I can say a few things about this. We did look at estrogen levels um, at, in adolescence uh, at P35 around the same time we were looking at uh, those pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And we actually didn't see any difference then in circulating estradiol. However, um, what we have seen is that females exposed to maternal separation do have um, early uh, precocial initiation of puberty. So they actually show um, external uh, signs of puberty earlier after maternal separation than males. And when we look earlier in development around postnatal age 25, we do see higher, uh, higher levels of estradiol in those females. And so we're starting to, we're already starting to look into whether that actually can by itself just um, affect different levels of, uh, of connectivity uh, in the, it, with, with the prefrontal cortex, because that's something that we also are seeing happening in females and not males. So just directly speaking, we think that that's actually true. The estradiol levels are affecting um, brain development. What that actually has to do with, with, um, with, with immune signaling, we don't know. I think that's really interesting. Um, we do know that males also around that same time did have lower levels of testosterone. And we know that testosterone is really important in the production of IL-10, right? So, um, so we're interested in that mechanism as well. So there's, yeah, there's a lot to look at in terms of pubertal hormones. I'm gonna embed sort of three questions. One of them is mine as well. And it has to do with some of the emerging directions that you're going forward, looking at behavioral deficits. Um, but the questions have to do with um, interactions of males versus females in their, with their social environments and differences possibly in threat and aggression. And part of, and, and more specifically, if I drill down on that, my question was whether early life stress alters um, the uh, social dominance of males differentially than females. So they're more likely to be experiencing threat or social threat and be dominated by males in that social environment. And then related to that is, um, well, let me, that's, there's another question, but first, 
that's sort of related to that, but let me get you to ask that question first. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. So I, I can sort of tease that apart when we're talking about threat detection per se, um, we have looked at that and we see um, actually, if you're looking at, um, if you're looking at anxiety-like behaviors, which I do not think is the same thing as threat detection in terms of how we can look at that in animals. Um, we actually see that um, both males and females are showing anxiety-like behaviors um, after maternal separation. Um, and we, we do see some sex differences, but the truth is they're, they're, not, um, they're not that reproducible. So right now I would say that both males and females do show, uh, show anxiety-like behaviors. However, that's not particularly talking about threat. And um, that's the kind of thing we're actually only first now starting to look into uh, is, is, uh, um, is sex differences in social threat. And we're actually starting to look at this in a really kind of, I think, interesting way. We're trying to um, use um, their social cues. Rats have their social cues are ultrasonic vocalizations. And so we're actually starting to play back uh, ultrasonic vocalizations to males and females to see if they um, are differently affected by that potential social threat. Um, so that's actually the one thing that's actually in this, this grant proposal that I, I just um, am able to start uh, utilizing. So we're going to be looking into that, but we don't know. Okay. So related to that, sort of extending to that, is, is whether they, you've been looking at a certain subset of behaviors and so are there sex specific findings in other domains of behaviors? And, and I think it gets into what we were talking about before the talk and some of your work, and that is on different tasks such as alcohol ingestion or alcohol Q reactivity in humans. Mm -hmm. And related to this is then, um, is, that, is that some of the measures that you're, um, the measures of social cognitions, um, I've not been str as strongly related to inflammatory markers as some of the other um, behaviors that we find at least in humans, like reward, motivation, novelty seeking. So, I mean, it, these kind of questions overlap, which is why I brought them together. And so, you know, what is your plan to address kind of the specificity of these effects or look at the generalizability across multiple behavioral tasks? Yeah, so right, that was actually the reason I, I was, uh, was, I wanted to talk about cognition because cognitive function kind of crosses a lot of these domains, I think. Um, when you look at more specific behavioral domains like depressive like um, uh, uh, behaviors versus um, externalizing kind of behaviors like, you know, addiction like behaviors, we do see sex differences. And so females really do seem to um, express more depressive like um, behaviors compared to males, uh, and especially after a second hit of stress. That's another thing. Both depressive and anxiety-like disorders, uh, behaviors seem to be, we see that more in females after multiple hits of adversity compared to males. So that's one domain that's different. And then um, addiction-like behaviors. So we looked at condition place preference after uh, in for cocaine and condition place preference, we saw much, much more robustly in males than in females after maternal mm -hmm. separation. So those are two things we've seen. Okay. And that's what we really want to look into. We're almost out of time, but I think there's one question that I think is so you know, relevant. I mean, you've looked at this maternal separation, but and and seeing these sex differences, but it, it begs the question as to whether the interactions of the, the male pup versus the female pup with the mother is different, and 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 can do you have data on to what extent that yeah. difference in that maternal interaction um, and that disruption of that interaction is what's producing this differential change. Absolutely. We're very interested in that and very cognizant of that, right? So the one thing we really aren't able to do yet um, very well is to be able to actually look in the nest at how mom is behaving towards males versus females, because we know it is different, um, uh, but we aren't able to actually assess it in our paradigm. However, what we have done is we, we just have a paper out um, uh, in Frontiers of Human Neuroscience looking at... Uh, pup ultrasonic vocalization. So how each individual pup that's been exposed to, we did maternal separation and also limited bedding, this measure of, of, um, of limited resources. And we looked at how they vocalize in response to isolation over development. And we did see sex specific changes in their trajectory of this communication um, nice. that seems to actually, we're looking now at how it correlates with later behavior. And it actually does correlate with later social behavior. Nice. So yeah, it's a great question. Good. 
Well, we're out of time and, you know, we have some other questions, but what we'll do is these questions that are, that are remained unanswered. And thank you so much for all your questions, the audience. Um, those questions will be um, uh, collated by Marina and then sent to Heather and she will um, attempt to answer them as to best as she can. So thank you again, Heather, for just a great talk. And it was really wonderful to see these data and hear firsthand from you about the work that you're doing. Thank you. This was really, really, uh, this is really enjoyable. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, Heather. Have bye -bye. a great day. Take care. Bye.